Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 298 for Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. Folks, and welcome back or welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are things in Napomo, my friend? Nice. You know, the weather's getting really nice, actually. Uh, just recently, you know, we've had a couple of days in the mid-70s and sky is blue and outdoor gigs are starting to at least for solo stuff. Yeah. I haven't seen any band things. You know, I've seen people scheduling stuff out a little bit later. Yeah. We got asked to do, uh, the house rockers got asked to do a, uh, a town, a bar that we play at is one of our regular places about 40 miles from where, you know, the band is kind of centered and, uh, the town has, uh, started, um, shutting down, Mm. Uh, to street to street traffic and uh, starting to do things to try and I don't know so much as it's the town the town is allowing it I'm guessing like the local downtown business district is kind of organizing these sure things. and we got asked to play outside I started asking the guys that they'd be up to it it's the end of, I, he asked me what dates I wanted and I said let's let's shoot for June you know, yeah. we'll be ready by June yeah that's great. And, yeah, so that's probably going to be our opening up gig at, at the end of June. Um, although, I don't know, right here and right now, not to spend too much time on this, but it the it feels like there's a threat that things might go the other way before too long. Are you feeling the same thing? Um, you know, there's the discussion about it, but in general here, things are moving forward. In the last week, so I now have 12 gigs booked between – now and Labor Day. Uh, That's great, man. Yeah, between... 12, 12 full band gigs? Um, I think three three or four of them are monkey fist gigs, so call that full band or not. I mean, it's acoustic. It's, the, you know, the three of us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the rest of them are bitter pill gigs with, yeah, absolutely a full band. Um, you know, so... Well, and that's I, exciting, man. I think they're all outside. There might be one that's indoors. You know, everybody... Certainly everybody in the bands is either vaccinated or on deck to be vaccinated. I uh, I think as of, well, today's the 31st of March. So here in New Hampshire, anybody 30 and up can be on the list as of this morning. And then as of Friday morning, anybody 16 and up can be on the list. So essentially after this week, anybody that's not a child can, can, you know, uh, sign up and, and get their, their vaccination plan going if, if they want to. And so, yeah. So things are moving, which is good. Um, but, but again, I think all of these gigs that I have on deck are outside at the moment. It won't surprise me, though, to see August, September, October, especially gigs indoors, you know, assuming they're and obviously all of these come with, you know, asterisk pandemic. Right. Like if things go sideways, they they will nix these gigs. Uh, you know, I booked an October, late October indoor gig. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that seems at the moment that seems like absolutely doable. Per perhaps yeah, even and sooner than that. Is, but yeah, you know, subject to change if stuff changes. I mean, the change stuff is, is no longer subjective, right? Because businesses, it's right. not like it was last March where, like, should we? Should we not? Oh, they're you're doing some things down. You know, let's let's read the tea leaves. Let's see what people are saying. Yeah. But now it's like there's a town not too far from here that kind of played with fire a little bit and was and and let the the business owners kind of drive the conversation and the state basically, you know, wagged a finger at them a couple of times and now is like taking out the fine book and saying, we're very, we've been very serious about this. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. There's some, I think it's, and I, I should know this, but I don't um, cause it's not my job to know. It would be a club owner's job to know, but I think for indoor gigs right now, there's some, like three person limitation on bands or something. It has to do with yeah. all the social distancing and which, I mean, fine. I, I, I suppose that that makes sense. I, I think, but I think those things are going to evolve very quickly over the next six to eight weeks. Um, you know, as, as, as we continue to move through this, I, I mean, obviously could go in the other direction too, obviously, but you know, 
Yeah. No, it's, I'm, I'm excited. You know, when I was, it, it, like I said, this last week has been, it's been crazy with the calendar. It's like I, people were asking me for blackout dates, like, you know, Billy with, uh-huh. with bitter pill. He's like, can you give me your blackout dates? It's like, Oh man, I, I, I keep a, um, a kind of a Google doc of, of dates, you know, Thursday, th- Thursday through Sundays of each week that I would keep up to date with what's available so that anybody that needed to book me, you know, would be able to just check that without having to wait for me to reply. And I hadn't updated that in, you know, over a year. <laughs> so it was like, Oh, I don't have those wow. for you, but I, I can create it. Like, you know, I have it on my, on my schedule every other Friday to update that. And I have just deleted it every time it's come up. So the next time it comes up, I'm actually going to update it, which is great. Like it's a nice thing. So, Hey, so I have something interesting to bounce off you. So um, um, a few places that are opening. One is a, a public concert series and one is a club. Okay. Um, the club has asked for, uh, they, they put a, uh, on social media, they put up a, um, when we open up, what bands would you like to see play at our place? Nice. So obviously all of the bands have said my band of course and and get their fans to say our band right sure that and makes sense that yeah that doesn't make sense though because here's the thing um the only thing that you're getting from this is who makes the most social media noise right yeah. and you don't know whether those you know like you know this better than almost anybody right the disconnect between what people are willing to do on social media and what they're actually willing to do in real life <laughs> is a, is a significant thing so Story of my so life. you know if you're a club owner and you ask that and you know a band was can get their people to say you know or one band more pushes their their followers to say you know choose my band um that does not necessarily equate to butts and seats when you open your club right and the net of this is and again, this is a thing in my life where I'm very cautious about asking for input for things. Sure. Because I always find if you ask for input and then don't take the input, you've created a thing. You know, the, right. The you, you've, which, you've made it people think that they have a voice. And, and then if you yes. tell them they didn't ever actually have a voice, you've upset them more than if you would never have asked them in the first place. Exactly. And there's a leadership skill to this, like, totally. you know, in leading a band where you want to encourage input and then finesse it because, you know, like in my band, I'm going to get 10 different inputs and, you know, someone's not going to get their, their input acted on. Right. So, but there is a leadership tactic to um, encouraging participation. So people feel heard, uh, but not making them butt hurt if, if their yeah. input is not, is not the one that wins the day. Right. So there is that, but anyway, so I was just kind of thinking about that. So your, your first reaction was make sense. Yeah. Ask the public who they want to see, but you're not really asking the public anymore. Really what happened is the bands took over this thread and said, me, 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 me. And, uh, and again, the, you know, the bands that encouraged their followers, I opted out of that activity just for the reason of clearly what was going on here. I didn't want to be part of that type of a feed. Right. Huh. So I was like, you know, my band has a decent reputation around here. If, you know, and the owner probably knows me, I would say almost definitely knows me. And, you know, we, we have a good reputation for bringing a crowd with us. So I'm, I'm not going to play in that sandbox of, of uh, me, 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 me. Cause it, you know, seems like. All right. Seems like, you know, just, yeah, seems I mean, like just a social media game. It is, but the whole thing is a game. If we zoom out a little bit. So I, I don't like, how else is a club going to figure out which bands still are viable, right? I mean, pandemic changed a lot of things. And, the, you know, when people are ready to play, when people are not ready to play, if a band has even survived it, like all of that. And social media is probably the the least, I'll say it's the best, but it also means that it's the least worst way to gauge <laughs> that kind of that to get a sense of that. And it's certainly, I don't know, man, shouldn't easy. the booking people be out there, you know, figuring out what's going to be best for their business. Right? But isn't that so, what they're doing? I mean, like, like, like to, to your point, I think that's exactly, they are figuring out what's best for their business by, by polling on social media. Now, does that mean that's the only thing they could be doing? No. Is it the only thing they're doing? We don't know, but maybe, uh, Fair enough. You know, but I think I think that's exactly what they're doing. They're they're starting to get a sense of okay, look, you know, we heard about we asked this question, 
we're aware that there's a game being played fine. You know, which are the top 10 bands that motivated their people? Because if they can motivate them to do this, they will they will motivate some percentage of them to actually come out and see them. And, you know, these days it might be like in 2021, the percentage, especially as we get further into 2021 and more people are comfortable going out. I would say that the percentage of social media to butts in seat converts that you get now is probably going to be more than it was in say 2018 when people hadn't been stuck in their homes for a year, I, yeah. you know? So I, I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing, but I, I mean, I think you have to see what it is. It eyes wide open. Like, yes, it's a game. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad one. And if a band, you know, if a band has that relationship with their fans, that it's, it makes sense to encourage them. Like, yeah, great. I, you know, I would, there's probably a generational thing in there somewhere. Um, but it, I, I think that's a pretty normal thing in certain circles. So, so full disclosure here. So I don't look like a total fool. So I told you that you look like, (laughs) well, I'm I'm about to look like a fool. So I'm giving (laughs) too much credit. So I said there's two, there were two entities that I was aware of that one was a, a a civic festival or civic concert series and one with a bar. And I just talked about the bar. Actually, the first one was a civic concert series. And they were like, we, uh, we want to, um, we want to get the community's input on uh, if you would come, if we did a, a socially distanced one, because it was a really pa- crowded and packed one. Sure. And so they actually had a survey that they wanted people to do. And I think the last line of their post was, and if there's any particular band you'd like to see. Right. And so that came out about a month before the club did theirs. And, and I, I do have to own that. I shared that and said, you know, th- this, this, uh, concert series that we enjoy playing is asking for input from people who go to it about whether, whether you would go, whether you would pay, you know, all these types of things. So, you know, it, really interesting questions actually. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I kind of also added and, you know, they want to know if you'd like to see any bands don't, don't hesitate to say the house rockers. I kind of said that. And then, and what was, we were the, I was the first to do that. And then, you know, many other bands did it. And then I saw that this club had kind of put it out. So I, I, I'm not entirely altruistic and, sure. and blameless in the whole situation. But uh, the net net of the club was, is that, you know, many of the bands that um, that had some noise going. I mean, it was nice. House Rocker fans kind of spoke up for us and in a respectable number. Certainly not the most, you know, anything. But um but there were a lot of bands that were like, and the reason I bring this up is I always kind of think about like, what makes a vibrant scene? And if you have a vibrant scene, aren't you going to get more music fans engaged if you have really good bands playing at all these types of things? And then, you know, you know, the, the, the bar goes down and it's like the, the bar owner doesn't care about really good bands. They care about really good drawing bands. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then the bar goes down, you know, further. Right. And so that, that was actually more my reflection of it is like, bands that I know that really, you know, wouldn't be terribly exciting, you know, to take a gig in, in a place that's actually a pretty good place. Um, you know, but because they can make some social media noise, can they talk their way into a gig? And is that good for the, making the overall water level go up? That was mostly my reflection of this. It's like, you know, you kind of want to see, you know, you want, you want gigs to be hard to get. You have to be good to get them. But, you know, not how I don't works, control though. that bar. You have it, to be, you hard. have to be good at drawing people. If you're, if you're playing in bars, you have to be good at yeah. drawing people. No, no, to I gigs. get it. I, I know you get it. I agree. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. But anyway, hey, just a thought. No, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. And it, and you are, you know, with every step that you take or don't take with this, you are further crafting your brand. And so, you know, it, it is worth dissecting this a little bit and being aware of how yeah. this, how this reads to others. Right. And, and again, for some bands like that, that reads as part of their brand and for others, it's like yeah. absolutely not. And both of those things are okay. So, yeah. Hey, I watched, um, I mentioned last week that, uh, that there were three movies that I watched as part of South by Southwest. Again, yeah. I didn't, I didn't go to Austin. Austin came to me um, and they did a really good job with it this year. Unlike last year where it, like South by Southwest was literally canceled a week before I would have flown down there. 
right? Because that was the big one, as I remember. That was like the first huge thing that was canceled on a, on almost a moment's notice that let you know that we're we're going to be in for something. It, it it was it was certainly the first one in this country. Um, Mobile World Congress, which happens in Barcelona in February each year. That that was I was in actually I was at a different conference in um, L.A. at the end of January when MWC was canceled. And that was like, mm. whoa, that was the day I bought travel insurance for my, uh, my February trip to Mexico to go see fish, which worked out like that trip happened. But if it were a week later, I don't think it would have. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but you're right. South by Southwest was the one that it was like, uh Oh, okay. Wait, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> like, and it almost like there was a big controversy over whether they should or shouldn't have canceled it. Cause in the moment you couldn't know. I mean, they, they made this call and, and there was a, you know, there was a lot of hand wringing about it, um, on both sides of the equation. And, and honestly, in retrospect, it's, you, we still don't know if it would have been okay to host that festival. Like it, it timing wise, it was so close to the beginning of all of this, who knows, but this year they, they planned, they did the whole thing online. And, uh, and again, you know, watching films was really an excellent uh, experience. They did a great job. They, they released the South by Southwest app for all kinds of TV platforms, including, you know, Apple TV and Roku, and I think even Samsung TV. And we, we were able to, you know, watch these films. And um, so there were three music related documentaries that I watched. I, I always go for, it's a section of films that South by Southwest called calls 24 beats per second, uh, which is their sort of twist on merging film and music uh, in one like catchy little name. So, um, so I watched three of these. The first one I thought initially was odd that it was not part of the 24 beats per second thing. And that was the Demi Lovato dancing with the devil movie. As soon as I watched it, I understood exactly why it wasn't part of 24 beats per second, because it was not a documentary about a musician playing music. In fact, it, it arguably it was a documentary about a musician not playing music. They had filmed a documentary and almost like finished producing it. I understand for her prior tour. And then she overdosed uh, on, on fentanyl, it turns out. And, uh, and spoiler alert, they, I, I'm, we're definitely going to share things that you would not see unless you watch these movies. So if, if you don't want to learn about these things, then please, you know, skip this section of the show. But, um, but, she, and, and at that point after she OD'd and survived, uh, she decided, no, I don't want to put out that documentary. I want to do something different. And so this was a, a movie that was about her overdose, her addiction, her recovery, sort of, you know, very, um, very open look at, at all of this, which, which was, it was fascinating to watch. It was really heavy to watch because for South by Southwest, I watched it as a one part 90 minute movie. It's been released on YouTube and it is a five part documentary. And for a, for a subject that's this heavy and this intense, I think that's a way smarter way to get people to watch it. I mean, I watched the whole thing and was fascinated by it, but it was really heavy to take. Um, whereas doing it in 15 minute chunks, I can totally see where people would be totally hooked on this. Like, okay, now I want to see the next one now. And I think mm. as of this moment, four of the five are actually out on YouTube. So you can, you can watch this. Um, and it really, but really well done and, and a really fascinating insight into addiction, which I know is, you know, something that um, certainly, it affects everybody's world, but um, it's cert it, some it, more directly than others. Some more directly than others, and certainly, you know, in the musical world, we we wind up running into it um, probably more frequently than in many other worlds. Um, so it, it was a fascinating story and really really well told. I was in, you know, even though it wasn't a, a documentary about like music per se. I, I was yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Cool. Um, the next one that I watched was a documentary about music. It was uh, Tom Petty, Somewhere You Feel Free. So this, um, they had filmed essentially enough footage to make a documentary during the making of uh, Tom Petty's Wildflowers album, which, it, and there were some fascinating things that I learned from this. So that was, you know, an album that was a, Tom Petty led album, not a heartbreakers album. Right. 
And I didn't realize how much of a democracy the Heartbreakers were until I saw this film. Because that was the whole reason for Wildflowers is, is Tom had some ideas and he wanted to just do them without having to exist inside of a democracy. Now, in the end, it basically became the Heartbreakers as his backing band, Yes, uh, which was interesting. Now, they changed drummers, right? Because that was the first record that Steve Ferroni was on. And he didn't even know who he was. He didn't even know he was going <laughs> to an audition Oh, let gosh. alone who he was auditioning for. He thought he was just going to play a session. They flew him from New York to LA as he's like loading his stuff in. He sees Kenny Aronoff's drums leaving. And so, you know, it, and, and even that he said, didn't seem all that odd because there were, there were lots of sessions, you know, take the Steely Dan model, for example, though there were many bands doing it where it was like, okay, well I want this drummer to play on this record and that guitar player to play on this song. And the record would have, you know, six or eight different permutations of musicians. So he was like, okay, whatever. Like, that's fine. And then of course, obviously, you know, in comes Petty and Campbell and, you know, it's like, oh, well, this is, this is interesting. What's happening here. But he was, yeah, sworn to secrecy about something. He didn't even have the information. He was sworn to secrecy anyway, you know, uh, but obviously he got the gig and, and, um, but it, it was, the, so this was a documentary about Tom Petty, but Tom Petty was in it a lot because it really was about that process of making that album and, and changing producers to Rick Rubin. And it was really, in, there was a lot with Rick Rubin too. There was a lot with all of them. The, yeah. um, the end of the movie, they was, you know, shot today and, and there were parts that were shot today sort of interspersed throughout, but at the end, you know, Tom obviously was not there uh, because he had passed away and they kind of glossed, you know, after having watched the Demi Lovato movie, which, you know, let addiction be the sort of focal point of the movie. It was a little weird watching this Tom Petty thing where they just sort of skimmed the surface of, of the, you know, the fact that Tom Petty died also of an overdose and but I, isn't he was an addict. Isn't his daughter, um, one of the executive producers. Correct. I, I believe that's and, right. Yeah. That's and right. is it fair that um, this is more like a, a, a legacy legend. Correct. Yeah you know, vehicle than it is, you know, some kind of hard hitting journalism that, that digs into something else. A absolutely. Yeah, no, it, it was, this was a, and, and I liked it for what it was like being able to really see into the, the creative process of, of Tom Petty, yeah. that guy's ability to write a song. It was, I mean, obviously we all know the outcome of all of these things, yeah. seeing into that process and how effortless so much of this, of course, not every song was effortless for him, but so many of them were. And, and he really had, I mean, I, I know it sort of goes without saying that he had a talent for this, but seeing it happen, I've worked with a lot of songwriters and, uh, and he really had, had a special way about, uh, at least from the way it was portrayed in the film, which seemed extremely honest. I don't think so. You know that there's a, making it up. there's a four hour um, documentary about Petty called running down a dream. Do okay. You, you I know of it. Yes. Yep. 2007. It came out. And um, in that, I bring this up because in that Rick Rubin, you know, who is, never really produced that style of music. Wasn't known, you know, he was no, the he wasn't. producer, right? Yeah. He said Petty had an uncanny ability to channel and get out a, a, a perfect four minute song like nobody he's ever seen before. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that much is clear in this movie too, especially with the wildflower stuff. I mean, it, 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 because that's what it was focused on, but obviously that wasn't the only time he did that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, it was what he did. And there, um, you know, there was one, one song and I, oh, shoot, I can't remember the name of it, but he, I can't remember which song it was, but, but he said, Oh yeah. You know, I just kind of sat down, I turned on the tape deck and, and I, I, Create I, I the first thing that came out was essentially the finished version of that song. It's like oh my gosh. who does like screw yeah. you like <laughs> like but thank goodness he did that. I mean it's it screw you really is th you know for not taking <laughs> care of yourself and not being here still doing that. That's yeah. the part where it's kind of upsetting. Um, but you know, yeah. So a couple, th couple things. Couple things about it. So you yeah. know, you know that Petty is like in my headspace, not far below Bruce in, mm. in terms of stuff that I love. Like, sure. you know, I've seen Petty so many times live and, you know, just if, and actually if, if I could, 
magically play in a band that the heartbreakers would be the band that I would want to play in. Right. I mean, I just, the sound of that band is perfect. I mean, yeah. the sound of the drums always has been perfect. I thought Stan Lynch was an amazing drummer. Agreed. Um, he was Peroni in the movie great, too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very yeah. unique. I mean, you know, that you know, beaten in uh, breakdown, the beaten American girl. Oh, Those yeah. are iconic, you know, Amer rock and roll beats. Right. Absolutely. Um, Froney's fantastic also and a, and a great, a great fit. And they chose wisely. Did you ever see when um, Grohl set in with the heartbreakers on Saturday Night Live? Yes. Yeah. I remember that. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, that, and that's kind of mind blowing because there's Grohl hitting like Grohl hits. And again, it was, it was, it's good to be, it's uh, no, it's, um, um, uh, what's the song that Grohl played on? Oh, uh, honeybee. Yeah, that's right. It was Honeybee. Yeah. Honeybee. Right. Yeah. Anyway, and Grohl is being Grohl back there. And it's the and it and it it sounds different. Whereas to me, Frony was almost a natural extension of what Lynch did. It became and, and, groovier, and, I think. I, I fair enough. Fair, it, you know, I mean, he was you a, would know this he, in a deeper way than I would. He was but, a yeah. song he, he he was a song supporting player, whereas Stan Lynch was a song creating player. Yeah. He, he, Songwriter, singer, you know, one yeah. of the, ma the main uh, harmony singers. Correct. Yeah. So Lynch, Lynch brought a different thing to it. And totally. I think Lynch was amazing. I mean, I just love Lynch's drumming and I love Ferroni's drumming as yep. well. Same. But man, you know, the heartbreakers are, are the, those songs and just, that's just, again, one of those things. How do five guys in Gainesville, how do four guys in Liverpool, yeah. The symmetry of that become what that is. And, you know, when you say that the heartbreakers were a, um, were more of a democracy than you thought, I'm actually surprised to hear that. I didn't know that. And so I'm looking forward to watching this, but you know, Mike Campbell is a world-class unique artist yeah. who's written, you know, Campbell wrote boys oh. of summer and, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the innocence, right. So he's written some pretty amazing songs himself. Yet the, the, you know, the magic that can happen when the right guys are together. So I would imagine Petty sensed that. I mean, Petty knew where his oh, yeah. strengths were and tell what he, and Petty also a strong personality. He knows what he would do and would not do. Right. And he was a leader of that band and I'm sure he knew when. But, well, um, he, he was not though. That's, that's what I'm saying is he was the leader when they were doing the, the, the uh, wildflowers album. But prior to that, no, it was very much. A democratic process. I mean, that was. So I'm going to have to watch that because after watching that, you know, running down a dream documentary and yeah. reading Petty's Petty's biography, um, Petty's a really strong, yeah, willed human being. So you know, it'll be interesting to see how that blends with what they show, yeah, in what you saw because uh, that, that that doesn't jive to what I understood. But anyway, it was just, it was fascinating. Wildflowers is a freaking amazing album. I mean, it really. It, and I guess the the story is it could have they wanted it to be a double album. He wanted it to be a double. Well, album. and now it is right because you can get Wildflowers right. and more that came out more recently, obviously. But right, yeah, yeah. But Although the thing to me is, it, it 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 I I'm not exactly sure what, what the delineation is because it does sound like a Heartbreakers. Well, I mean, it, it becomes the Heartbreakers. It, it like right. it's, it's Heartbreakers with a different drummer and a different producer, but but the drummer. Is stuck around like, it, yeah, it, it was a very it was it was fascinating watching it because, as they said, you know, as he said, I wanted to be freed from the democratic process early in the movie that like it, it just sends a shockwave through me like, whoa, OK. And it, it wasn't someone else saying this. Those are literally Tom's words, you know, yeah, on camera. And 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 it was like, but wait, I know about this record like it, that was the heartbreakers. And it's like, well, yes and no. It, you know, it did it, it, obviously you know, when you look back at it with, with hindsight, it's all the heartbreakers. This record was a little bit different though, in that it was led by more by Petty than anyone else. But yeah, no, it was fascinating. I, I, it, that movie was fantastic. It was, it really kind of blew me away. And then, and where can people see it? I don't believe that's the, that's the problem with these things is you just got to keep an eye out for when these things get distribution. I get the feeling that well, I know obviously the Demi Lovato movie you can already see. Um, I get the feeling that this one and the the next one that I'm about to talk about, the Under the Volcano movie about Air Studios Montserrat. Um, I get the feeling that they are further down the path of distribution than many other films at South by because these three were the ones that you had to I had to watch in a limited viewing window. So many of the movies at South by Southwest, you know, once the festival started, you could just watch them whenever uh, over the course of many days. 
with these, I had a four hour window in which I had to start the film. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that tells me that there's some restrictions on it. And maybe that, that, and I'm I, now I'm speculating that that then means that they're going somewhere or further down that path. But that under the volcano movie, really fantastic. Um, it, it is about, so when George Martin left EMI, he started building his own studios and he called them air studios, um, which, oh, now I can't remember what the, what air, air studios stands for something. And I will uh, associated independent recording. And, uh, and, and he, he wound up building one in the late seventies on an Island in the Caribbean, Montserrat. He bought a, um, an estate down there. So this studio starting late seventies until, you know, almost the end of the eighties was a destination studio for, for bands. And, and that, that's sort of, that's a thing that is, that was popular then and made sense then with all the budgets that existed then. It's not so much popular now. There's like Bearsville in New York that it was part of this. There was Le Studio in outside of Montreal. There, you know, there were, there were several of these, uh, but Air Studios had a, had a, a unique flavor because it was on this island of 12,000 people, right? And so he had this estate. It, he built a recording studio in the house, but you would also stay in the house. And I think there, was, there were two houses maybe on the, on the property there. But it was only one band at a time that would record there. It wasn't like, you know, for example, a big studio like Abbey Road where there's, you know, three rooms or, you know, Power Station or whatever, where there's multiple bands that are just going to be kind of in and out of there. This is a band would book the entire facility. They would stay at the studio. Um, at the, the staff would cook for them. It was, you know, mm. a package deal. And the nice part about those sort of destination studios in general is the band just gets to sort of live and work at the same time. And that for the right band, that can be a very rewarding thing where it got even more interesting with Montserrat is that vibe didn't end at the property line. They were free to go anywhere they wanted on Montserrat and people simply didn't care that they were like rock stars. They knew who they were, but as, and they interviewed some of the people on the Island for this film. They said, look, you know, if they were a footballer, we'd be the soccer player to those of us here in the U S we would have been all over them, but you know, okay. So Elton John's here. Well, we can hear Elton's songs on the radio anytime we want. Why is it a big deal that he's, you know, eating lunch in that little hole in the wall over there. And, and that remained throughout the time that this studio was in existence. And so truly people like Elton loved recording there because they were free to just like hang out and di weren't mobbed at the, mo you know, at the moment they left the the property, they didn't have to hide. They, they could just be themselves. And, and for many bands it worked out, Lou Reed hated it down there. He said he needed traffic. Uh, it, you know, it was no bueno uh, without that. And so again, you know, the right people, Jimmy Buffett, no great surprise was one of the first artists that they recruited to come and record down there. He loved it. Um, and, and there's some interesting stories that he tells uh, in the movie. Dire Straits was down there. The police recorded down there. Now there's a police recorded two records down there. Dire Straits um, got there after the police. And there were a couple of interesting stories. One of them was from one of the, the uh, guitar players in Dire Straits, uh, not Knopfler, but one of the other guys said, yeah, you know, there was one day he said it was great, like going and hanging out for a month and and just recording and, and being able to immerse ourselves. He says, but, you know, that island, you can hear that island on every record that was made down there. And he said there was one point he said, well, we're in the studio and like everybody's in, like, you know, has no shirt on. Everybody's in shorts. They've got sunscreen on their noses and we're playing some song at like 40 BPM. And he says, I had to stop and be like, guys. I know we're going in the pool between takes and this is amazing, but we're making a rock and roll record for more than the 12,000 people that live on this Island, <laughs> you know? And, and he's like, we've really got to add some energy to the mix. And he said, that was the only problem was if you, it, you know, it, the, the Island could overly influence, but, um, so the police recorded there. And then, uh, the next band was dire straits doing brothers in arms. And I think years before that, uh, Knopfler had seen the police doing their, their little stub on MTV where it was just the three of them dressed in their wild garb or whatever saying, 
I want my MTV. And for whatever reason, as soon as he saw that, he realized, oh, that would work with the melody of <laughs> Don't Stand So Close to Me. And that was all he ever thought about with it, right? Like it just, like it, it was one of those passing thoughts that somehow stuck in his brain over the years. And so he gets down to Montserrat and, you know, they're, they're recording or whatever. And he, uh, he says, man, you know, and they're, they're starting to put together money for nothing. And he says, man, you know, I, I really wish Sting was here. And somebody said, oh, he is, he <laughs> stuck around for vacation after the other members of the police and the, you know, the crew and all that left. What a story. And, and they were like, you want us to go get him again? Island of 12,000 people, like really not hard to find somebody. And, uh, he was like, yeah. And so they went and got sting from whatever watering hole he was hanging out at and brought him in. And, and that's how that, that, I mean, this how talk about iconic, right? Like, yeah. First of all, Knopfler was right. It does fit with that melody <laughs> brilliantly. Um, but there, there was just some interesting stories. There was, um, so obviously that, you know, that little bit of magic just happened, but it, it wasn't nearly as, as constructed as one might think. It was just mm. the, the magic of serendipity. And, um, uh, there was a story, Stuart Cope, the police got some of their best work and admit this, uh, all three of them were interviewed for the film. Police had some of their best work produced there. And, but the problem they had was there was nobody else to piss each other off and or for them to piss off. And so they only could focus those, those energies at each, other. at each other. And so yeah. they got the work done, but then they had to scatter. And, and it was at a time where their producer wanted everything separate. So instead of all playing in the big room, Copeland was like relegated with his drums to the dining room so that everything could be recorded in isolation. And as Copeland tells the story, he says, you know, with every little thing, uh, he says, our chief songwriter, he doesn't call him Sting, you know, but he says, our, our chief songwriter had this idea that he would not show us the songs until it was time to work on that particular song. And he's like, that's just how it was. And he says, so, you know, he brings in this demo that he had essentially recorded himself at home or whatever of, of every little thing. And it, he said, as soon as you heard it, you knew it was a hit. It was just, you know, obvious like, Oh, he did it again. Here's another one. Okay, great. And then they worked for a couple of days, trying different grooves. They tried a reggae groove with it. They tried a, you know, punk groove and they were going back and forth. And then, you know, one day after they sort of, you know, had a heated moment where they just didn't have anything and they sort of retired for the evening, Copeland comes in the studio the next morning. He's like, all right, you know what? Screw it. He says the way he recorded it on the demo, like that's what should be released. That's we all know that's the best version of this song. And the reason we're fighting is because we all know that that's the best version, but we didn't have anything to do with it. But that's what should be. He said, so here's the thing before the other guys even get here in the studio this morning, roll the tape. I'm going to go up to the drums, play me the demo. I'm just going to play a drum track along with that same groove, essentially. And, uh, and he said it was one take and that's the one you hear on the record. I love that. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but you know, but like that kind of thing wouldn't happen if they weren't living in a studio. And so there's, there's, this is a, a 90 minute movie full of stories exactly like that. And some really interesting things. Uh, obviously George Martin, it, it's interesting to see George Martin, not in a suit. He was like, I got so used to seeing him with the Beatles. All the footage is, you know, he's Mr. Corporate man. He was Mr. EMI yeah. it, at Montserrat, man. That dude was in shorts and a t-shirt and long hair and long hair, long hair. Uh, yeah, yeah. Longer than Giles's is now, which blew me away. Um, and Giles obviously is in the movie. Lady Judy Martin is in the movie. Uh, really, really well done. I, I, uh, you know, that was definitely my favorite of the, of the three for the week for lots of reasons. Um, but really fascinating stuff and some great stories from McCartney and Elton John. And really some of the best stories were from the, the staff and the, the residents of the island who, who really had some memories. Like they didn't go gaga over these people, but these people had an influence on them and they, you know, they really created some memories. So fascinating movie. I hope that it comes out soon so that we can all see it. I want to see it again. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And then of course the, the, the studio ended in the late eighties, uh, because a, uh, hurricane came through, um, and, and then after that, the Hurricane Hugo was what ended that studio. Uh, although 
it's interesting because the stones were the last ones to record there. Steel Wheels was created there. And that's really, they, they credit that environment to getting the stones back together. The stones credit that environment to getting the stones back together. Yeah. Really well done. So I, I, I won't tell any more stories. You can go watch it. Hopefully you can watch it. it again, it doesn't have distribution. I don't believe so. No, it's not, not uh, out yet. This is a normal well, thing. You've wet our whistle for all this. Dave. I know. I know. I know. It's exciting. This is the, the life of yeah. Dave. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so what else do we got, man? Oh, I wanted to tell you a story about something else that I observed and got me thinking about something that I did. And I think it's something that we all come encounter with. The question is, we, you know, we started the episode today talking about social media. Should you blast a venue that behaves badly? So a band here told a story about doing a gig okay. at a venue and being told right before they start that they weren't going to get paid. And you'd be like, what the heck? What do you mean they're not going to get paid? And they had gone to some effort to getting their fan base out to this gig. It, and it actually was an indoor gig, which is weird. But um, this this band hustled and got, you know, 50, 60 people. These 50, 60 people came to the gig. They bought beer. They bought food. Um, and the band played. They made a decision since they were told about this right before starting that um, that the guy wasn't going to have the money. It, w it wasn't a cover, um, uh, cover charge type of thing. Sure. Um, and so anyway, uh, a friend of the band who is also a musician hears the story and takes to Facebook and says, this is BS. This is not cool. Musicians shouldn't be treated that way. Uh, don't patronize. Don't patronize this, oh. this place. Oh. Now, I had a gig one time where... Um, I played a solo gig at a winery and uh, and they were odd about the payment when I was supposed to be paid at the end of the gig. And then they kind of gave me the runaround a little bit and I didn't get paid for a couple of weeks. And I was really irritated about it. I was irritated about the tone and the attitude. Like I was doing something wrong when I was just, you know, asking to get paid. Asking to get paid. And, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that it took two weeks and all that type of stuff. And I went on and it, it got a lot of traction. There's momentary feeling of vengeance, you know, like, aha, right? But I've thought about it a lot since then. This was probably three, four years ago that, that I did this. Sure. And so it comes up again, this band, you know, does this. And, then, and actually, one of the guys in the band jumps on the thread and he's like, yeah, you know, it's not cool. We, we had done a couple of gigs for this guy for free during the pandemic and, uh, and we were really not cool with this. And then the thread keeps going on. And a lot of people say, no, I'll never, I'll yelp the guy and all this stuff. And then um, the guy who's in the band comes back and says, well, the owner has uh, contacted me and he wants to work things out. And then all of a sudden the thread disappeared. It was deleted. Oh. So oh. I just want to get your thoughts. Like, <sighs> is this good? Do you go for vengeance? Do you, do you cleanse your soul if you've been wronged? I mean, what is the right way to look at this? Yeah, that's an interesting scenario. Um, I, I mean, it sounds like one can interpret and it, I, it is how I am interpreting it, but it doesn't mean it's right. It's 100 percent correct uh, because we don't have a control group to, with which to compare against. But it <laughs> certainly seems like this problem was not going to be solved if it didn't start to play out in public. And, you know, I see this a lot in the tech world, too, where, you know, a company will do something that, you know, is well within their right or not to do, but they're the 800 pound gorilla and you can't do anything mm -hmm. about them. And then suddenly it, you know, it becomes the hotness on Twitter or on Facebook and the company has, a, you know, suddenly there's somebody that finally finds this file at the bottom of their desk pile and decides to address it, you know, has nothing to do with the fact that it was on Twitter or Facebook, mind you. Um, but you know, it was just, we meant to get to this and now we're here. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and it certainly seems like this is one of those kinds of things where it wasn't going to, it was the, the club had moved past this until they were dragged back into it and realized, uh Oh, like we gotta, we have to do what appears to be the right thing, but there's some, there's a level of self-serving self-service that happens here. Right. Because well, I'll tell you the tell in all this to me was when the guy said we had played a couple of gigs for this guy for free, you know, while he was hurting to, during COVID. Yeah. And so to me that started a glaring, like you don't take someone's services for free. Right. 
you offer to do something, give them beer, give them a meal or something like so, that. Yeah. There's some, um, yes. So, so, you know, that there's little history of, 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 a, of a venue being willing to take for free that, you know, gets the, that's the meter going a little bit. And then again, you know, five minutes before someone's going to play, you know, to say, I'm not going to honor whatever agreement that they had, you know, that's just weird to me. Right. So yeah. again, bad behavior seems to be more, um, if it's an option for someone, like for some people, it's not an option. You don't do it. Right. And if you're ever forced to a place where you have to do something uncomfortable, you feel terrible, you find some way to, you know, in the, you know, these are long games, but you just don't come up to someone and say, Hey, you know, by the way, never mind today, you know, whether the guy was banking on the band would continue to play because their fans were there or, you know, wh- how, how heinous the, uh, you, I don't know. You're right. We don't have enough information for this, but a little bit of data that just says people who behave badly are, you know, are uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Right. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've experienced not exactly this, but I've experienced clubs. We had one club. It was really weird. They told us we will, you, we want you to do an audition and this was in the early days of Mike booking fling. He didn't quite understand that this was not really a good path to head down. And right. you know, we all need to learn these lessons and it, it, it was fine. Like we all were, we knew what we were getting ourselves into, but what sure. they had, what they had told him and we had all seen the email trail. So there was no real question as to this. They, the, the booking person said, look, here's the deal. You know, you come down, you play one set and then we'll have a conversation and, you know, if it's working out, if, you know, if, if it seems like the right fit for the room, you know, we'll invite you to play the rest of the evening and, you know, book you for future gigs. Okay, great. Like, you know what? Fine. We didn't have anything to do yeah. on this, whatever Thursday night. Again, eyes wide open going in fine. We get there and we, we, I was, I think this all started even before the first set, but certainly after the first set, we go to speak with, you know, the person in charge and like, oh, well, I don't have the the power to make this decision about this. And we're like, OK, well, <laughs> it, you know, we do. We just were, you know, suckered into, you know, in the car sales world, world they call the one legged presentation. Right. Like <laughs> you don't have the decision maker here. How like this is now, uh, you know, we're not on the same footing. And uh and so we're like, okay, well, what's supposed to happen? They're like, well, we can't tell you, you know, we like what's happening. The crowd was super into us that night. It was, you know, fine little gig. And we're like, well, but like, what's going to happen you in the just future? took something from us. Yeah. Like, the, implied, the implied exchange was that, that, you know, we were doing this for a reason. A decision maker would look at this and then we would go on. Yeah. You, we would have the terms of the deal. You've changed the, you've changed the deal. You Darth Vader does. Right. And so, <laughs> uh, so we were like, well, this is really awkward. And and this woman, I'm like, do you want us to keep playing tonight? And she's like, well, I, I can't tell you that. That's up to you. I'm like, no, no. Well, that's good. Well, I, it, right. But also, like, it's literally your place. Like, I'm not going to force, just because we're set up and we played one set. Like, I was trying to separate the two things. It was like, okay, we were both handed a raw deal. You didn't know, you know, this person that we were, this woman that we were dealing with, did not right. know the the deal that that Mike had made with a different person who was not there and somehow unreachable, uh, which, you know, okay, fine. Uh, you know, they, they, I mean, we showed them the emails. We're like, look, this is, they're like, wow, that really, like, that sucks. We were not informed of this. We've never done anything like that before. This is atypical. And so it was like, okay, well, we're done with that. And and so I was like, do you want us to keep playing? And she said, well, that that's not my decision. I'm like, no, no, no. It, that's what I'm saying is it is your decision. It's your club. Like we don't want to be unwelcome here. <laughs> like mm. you have to tell me, and they wouldn't. It was the most she because she didn't want to be, you know, even tacitly a part of this agreement that you know yeah. clearly it was obviously bad management at this place. You know that that an employee didn't feel empowered, knowing that everyone knew that it was like it was fully acknowledged that this was a. But, but let's twist that a little bit. So what I'm hearing actually is a decent sold employee knew that this was not cool mm-hmm. and wasn't going to, you know, wasn't there to try to give you a, even get an evening of free entertainment out of you for nothing. So it actually sounds like, so if they, if they hired someone right. who could at least recognize the moral dilemma they were in, that's at least no interesting. That was right? interesting, that, but they were not, they clearly were not empowered to do anything. And, and this woman was petrified of making the wrong decision and, yeah. you know, committing 
management to something that that management didn't want to be committed to. It, it was it was a bad scene. So we packed up and left uh, because Ooh. it was like, well, I don't you know, I'm not going to force this on you. We're just going to go. It's all fine. You know, we were going to pack up at some point tonight anyway, because that's yeah. how it works, <laughs> you know. And so we get home early. It's fine. We're not, we know we're not getting paid. We're not getting free beer. Like the bartender felt terrible, but he's like, I can't give you. And it was like, okay, so the management doesn't empower anyone here to do anything. Right. This is like, clearly it's not the fault of anyone in the room. How, except maybe us, because we, you know, didn't. I, the, yep. Yeah. You know, but if it's anyone's fault, it's ours for not having truly gotten this. I mean, we thought we had it clear, but we didn't, you know. And so we just left, but it was, and we've never played there again, obviously. Uh, yeah. But it was, yeah, it was bad management. And and it sounds did, like did this the story. management ever reach out afterwards and say, you know, I want to talk about your audition. Sorry. You know, like, like were they pulled away for a, for a emergency? Like, is there any, no, it, there was no, yeah. there was no, I'm sorry. Certainly there right, was so none of just, that. Yeah. We can just file this like, People who behave badly in business, that is a personality trait. <laughs> it's just it, how it know, is. If, yep. it, 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 once you learn that, don't don't willingly go back for that, right? So that, that would right. be the lesson. But my question is, is do you take it to social media and get your value? And let me preface. We, we did not. This is the this. first time I've ever told the story in public. And you'll notice, ah. A, no one has any idea what year this happened. No one has any yes. idea what state. And certainly no one has any idea what club. And, exactly. And that was very intentional in me telling this story. So, All right, good. And, and, and so we're going to end up in a very similar place. So um, I will start by saying I am constantly appreciative at my fellow musicians who make the moral choice before the financial choice. So, mm. you know, you and I have a similar amount of skin in these games and that we are business people during the day and we make a bunch of trade-offs as to the value of a relationship or the, you know, the value of a future opportunity. You know, we do a business analysis on things, right? Right. And, and uh, we will occasionally separate the human part of it or, or chalk it up to, you know, part of the equation, whatever it might be. Right. I am always um, uh, humbled when I see a friend who's a musician, a professional musician, who will not take grief or BS from somebody, even if they're, you know, even if the taking of that BS might lead to more gigs, better gigs, you know, whatever it might be. I, I'm always refreshingly aware that a creative mind has a, has a filtering process that enables them to create at the end of the day, right. That these types of things. So, so let me just start there saying like musician to say, you're a bad person. I know you're a bad person and I'm not going to give my art to you. That, that is an, a wonderful and beautiful thing to me. Sure. I yeah. will say that. Um, I don't think it's good at the end of the day to take it to social media. Venues change, venues change ownership. Um, venues change managers. Sometimes it's not the owner. Sometimes it's a manager who goes on a power trip. Um, things change. And, you know, in many cities, you know, we'll take Austin and Nashville out, out of New York and LA out of it, but many cities, you know, venues are finite, you know, and um, gigs are finite. And so, you know, I think it's good for musicians to talk in a constructive way, factual, you know, not, not, you know, ab amongst each other. Sure. But, but saying, you know, you did something to me, I'm going to try and hurt your business is probably not good in the karma in the karma department in the, in the medium and long run, like I said, things change. Well, not time. even, not even, and you're I, like, I, I don't mean to dismiss that. You're right in the karma department, but also truly in the business department. If I, even right now, if I shared the name of this venue, which would not be helpful at all, it would have, if it were ever going to be helpful, it would have been helpful, you know, the week after this happened to us, not literally uh -huh. years later, but even then, you know, like you said, things change. If I'm a club owner and I think, wow, man, like that was a crummy scenario for everybody that was involved. The band left. Yes, there was at least one person involved in the management structure there that it sounds to me like handled things improperly. But they haven't. Heard, I haven't even heard that person's side of the story. They mm. definitely haven't, you know. And so do I want to risk having some unfortunate scenario develop unintentionally? And then have this person be the type of person that's going to take me to task on social media. 
And you're weighing that against what benefit are they going to bring me by, by being in business together? And more often than not, we're going to say, eh, you know, I, I, there's other fish in the sea. I'll, I'll go swim with them. It's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stay away from this guy. Yeah. So well, I'd love to hear what other people think about this. I mean, like I said, this situation was really interesting to me. The owner made it right. And then the post came down, you, you know, and, and, uh, and the, da- but the damage may have been done. Like a lot of people saw it. A lot of people contributed to it. Yeah. A lot of people are aware of it. And, you know, I think in in the medium term, maybe that has a certain amount of satisfying. You wronged me, so I'm going to wrong you. But I think in the long term, my personal opinion now, I wouldn't do what I did a couple of years ago to that winery. I wouldn't, I yeah. wouldn't take it to you know and encourage my fellow musicians to play or not play. I would I would answer the question if they asked me. I had a hard time getting paid, you know, but I I would not I would not want to play the game of manipulating karma. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, yeah. You know, and those are the things we learn. Like, 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 you know, none of us are static people. And so we don't have to remain entrenched. I mean, what you're saying here is like, okay, I did this thing at the time. It felt right in hindsight. Uh, I certainly wouldn't do it again. And that's okay. Yeah, lesson like learned. lesson, right. Lesson learned. I, you know, I, I always say, I don't, we don't say it a lot on this show, but I pretty much say it everywhere else in my life. I love mistakes. And, and I, I, I call mistakes my tuition because it's how I justify all the money that they've cost me over the years, <laughs> but, but, but it like, it's true. Like, this is how we learn, you know, and I, like I said, I love making mistakes and, and things like this. I've like, I just shared a story where I don't think we made a mistake because we, well, we may have made a mistake in how we handled it within the club, but certainly mm-hmm. external communication. I think we did the right thing. Like, I still feel good about that, but, mm-hmm. um, but I've made lots of mistakes and, and a lot of them have, have cost me business in, in a variety of ways. And that's just, you know, how it goes and you learn it and then you, you iterate from there and that's okay. So, yeah, well, this was fun. I feel, I feel cleansed. Covered a lot of ground today. Huh? I do. Yeah. It's good. Cool. Good Thanks. movie reviews, Mr. Ebert. Thanks. Yeah. I love these. I love these movies. I want, I want more of them. I love, I love rock docs. Tell us what your favorite rock docs are. You know, we, we, I, we didn't, I don't think we talked about the, the, um, oh, I can't, I think of her name, the Billie Eilish movie that I saw recently too. Um, the one on Apple TV, the one on Apple TV. We'll save that for the next episode, but, but seriously, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Tell us what movies you like. Cause we'd love to hear about it. And, uh, and you know, we'll, and we'll share. So many the yeah. There's so many. so many good ones. So yeah, but, but they get overlooked really easily because they, they really only spread by word of mouth. So let's do some of that here. Feedback, get podcast.com post, get podcast.com slash Facebook in our, in our group. Let's, let's get this going. I think it's good. Otherwise that's what I got, man. You got anything else? Sometimes Dave. All right. That's it. Always be performing. Always, always. Thanks, Paul. Later. Later. Later.